Hello, please can you hear me? Good day. Yes, we can Good hear day. you. All right, great, great. All right, so um, thank you for coming. Uh, today is the last day, and uh, I hope you are all prepared for something awesome today. Um, I have uploaded the video for yesterday on our YouTube channel, PCB Africa. So those who missed yesterday, you can check it out uh, maybe after. And I also make sure to uh, make this today's recording available right after. As usual, we those who were here, you you, re you saw what happened yesterday. For me, I had a lot to learn and a lot to update and think about. I'm hoping I, I have such an experience again today. So without wasting much time, let us um, welcome Mr. Daniel Bika. Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to day two of science-based PCB design, EM physics demystified. I want to say again, thank you very much uh, to Professor Obeng. I am extremely pleased and honored to be part of this first series of trainings that are being offered by PCB Africa. Um, it is my sincerest hope that what we present is going to be uh, easy to understand because that's the main purpose and also very useful for you to use as you develop printed circuit boards in your daily uh, activities. I call this effective printed circuit board design techniques to improve performance. The main goal is to give you methods that will allow you to take the materials you're already buying, for example, a four layer printed circuit board and a certain mix of components and put them together in a way that makes them more effective without adding cost, with the ultimate goal being both signal integrity slash function and to pass your EMC compliance requirements for the particular market that you're dealing with. I want to uh, stress that I take a very simple approach to electromagnetic field physics. If there are any physicists that are um, in the audience, I want to apologize in advance because you're probably going to be rolling your eyes quite often. But for, for most people who are doing printed circuit board designs or electrical engineers, a deep understanding of the physics is not required. Just a good basic understanding of the nature of the electromagnetic fields and their behaviors and ways that you can use to control them so that they do the work that you really want them to do and get the results in your design as you, you desire. A quick commercial about NXP. We are a, a global semiconductor provider. Uh, it's the result of the combination of the Motorola semiconductor product sector, which was uh, spun off a number of years ago as Freescale Semiconductor and NXP Semiconductor, which was spun off from Philips. And we were spun off relatively the same time. And sorry, I have to keep admitting guess. And the goal was to create, when we merged together, a, a, a large company who had focus on multiple markets throughout the world, uh, NXP, was uh, wanted to get into the automotive market and Freescale was very strong with that. So we merged together to form a large company with, uh, I think it's a great company, the focus is on uh, inclusion and with uh, diversity and care for the planet. So our stewardship and we try to become leaders in that in the industry and provide products and methods of developing products that are going to support keeping our our world safe. So that's a little bit about NXP. I've been here for a long time. We'll talk about in a second. My first disclaimer is if you've ever taken any of my classes, I say the same things over and over and over again. Because if you're taking the class, then you still need, like me, to hear it again. It took me more than 10 years to convert my perspective from circuit-based 
theory, which I had been successfully applying to my designs for 25 or 30 years, to finally be able to accept the, the real science-based perspective that enables my designs to be successful in today's world of very small geometry devices and extremely high frequency act, act operation. So this is my 43rd year at the Motorola Freescale NXP. Uh, been in automotive for the last 30 years and for the first two thirds of my career, EMC and fields were all just black magic to me. And I was fortunate enough to work to meet Ralph Morrison, who made it his mission to teach me field physics and uh, or or he was going to kill me doing it. And I'm still alive. And Ralph was very successful in achieving his goal, which is to make it so that I was a very ex effective designer and my systems will perform the way I want them to because I follow some very simple rules that Ralph taught me. So a little bit about my mentor, Ralph Morrison. If you don't know who he is, please go find out. Ralph was one of the unsung heroes and pioneers of our industry. Unfortunately, we lost him in August of 2019. So Ralph was uh, a physicist. He got his bachelor's in physics in 1949. Uh, finally got his master's in electronic electrical engineering in 64. But he wrote a number of books. The first book he wrote, which was Grounding and Shielding and Instrumentation, was the, the very seminal text that's used by most of the electrical engineers and EMC consultants that are aware of the idea of physics. And if you ask a number of the, the currently well-known giants, such as Henry Ott, Howard Johnson, Lee Ritchie, where they got their start, and they will all say that they started with Ralph Morrison's book, Grounding and Shielding. And after that, he wrote a num another 12 more books. The last two were in the period during the time I knew him, and um, the, the very last one, Fast Circuit Boards, Wiley acts, actually contacted him and requested that he just write a new book. He was 92 at the time. So Ralph was, was very prolific. He was a best-selling author in this field. He sold more than 2 million books. But most of the people I talked to have never heard of him. But Ralph was the one who his entire career desperately tried to teach people that if electromagnetic fields were the key to go, doing proper design, that it wasn't electrons flowing in wires, it was the fields flowing in the spaces. And he said when he was doing his design work in the 40s and 50s, or 50s and 60s rather, he was developing uh, amplifiers that would measure millivolts of signals over miles of wire using vacuum tubes and transformers. And Ralph said that we have it easy when he was doing his work, you had to understand physics or things just didn't behave properly. And he was very successful. And then he found that there just was no documentation. There were no writings about the reality of the physics as applied to electro electronic engineering. And he started writing his first book and he spent some time teaching as well. Ralph was a, a violinist from a very young age. He played violin with the uh, Ar U.S. Army Symphony Orchestra. During the World War II, he was a, a technician that worked on radios. And he said that was the best job because those people were so scarce in the Army that they kept them as far away from the, the battlefield as possible. So that's where he got his start in electronics and then came out of the war with the GI Bill in the US and was able to attend college. And during his uh, time as a physics student, he actually was able to study under Feynman and has a, his roots way back into some of the giants of the physics industry. And then the picture of Ralph in the middle top here is that his 90th birthday, he did a, a recital where he played some of the most extraordinarily complicated music that you could imagine.
and uh, he was just still really wonderful. I was fortunate enough after I met him to be invited into his home on numerous occasions where he and his wife, who was a cellist, have a, a group of friends. So they had a string quartet and I would get to go there and have dinner and listen to them play. It was absolutely amazing. So even up till right before his death, Ralph was still actively playing guitar, playing his violin. He was driving his car and he was trying to discover some secrets that he believed still exist in the idea of electromagnetic field physics. And he was digging deeply into quantum physics to see where there were some more things that he really needed to understand. His final book was Fast Circuit Boards Energy Management. And every time Ralph would do a presentation, he would put this slide up. And when I was first going to his training classes, this just flew right past my, my head. I couldn't understand how important and how profound what he was seeing here was and how completely it applied to and defined our engineering challenges in electronics. Buildings have walls and halls. People travel in the halls, not the walls. Circuits have traces and spaces. Energy and signals travel in the spaces, not the traces. And somehow most of us have missed that whole perspective uh, as an industry. It isn't individuals, the entire industry, including academia, focused on the circuits or the, the actual um, uh, wiring instead of the space where the energy actually flowed. So this is really the uh, key. And I will say space so many times that you're going to be mad at me. And I wrote the song because I wanted to tell people to deprogram themselves from the idea of current flowing in wires. So this is the song I wrote to the tune of Megan Trainer's All About That Bass. And it basically gives you a quick review of electromagnetic field physics and gives you the idea that you have to think about current moving in a space. And we're going to get pretty deep into this idea as we continue this class. So this is the list of things we're going to talk about. You know, what changed? What are the basics of electronics? How do fields behave? What, are, what is a wave and what do we care about? And then we're going to start looking at how do we take the idea of what the electromagnetic waves are what you use to control them, and how do you design a circuit board to provide your product with the proper behavior that you need desperately. So we're going to talk about the changes. You know, things always seem to work in the past. When I started working back in 1980 with Motorola, I was working on 6800 development equipment, in-circuit emulators, instrumentation, I worked my way up into engineering and worked on 68,000, 68,020 systems. And, and I thought I was hot stuff. And, you know, basically you could wire anything together with wire wrap and, and it would work. And so the guidelines that were created by the industry during this period, as we went from um, just hard wires to vacuum tubes, to transistors, to integrated circuits, the geometry of the switches was so large and the time it took them to switch on and off was so long that compared to the physical structures that they were normally used in, there wasn't anything you could do wrong to make them not work. But unfortunately, that didn't mean that the rules we were using were correct. It just meant they weren't so bad that they caused it to fail. And as we went through the evolution of moving to smaller geometries and faster switching, the failure rates and the EMC issues started to slowly rise because you would change one or two ICs in a design. And sometimes it would cause a problem and sometimes it wouldn't. And just slowly the industry was seeing more and more failures in signal integrity and EMC but it's quite like the, the story of the 
the frog in the pan of water. If you try to put a frog in a boiling pan of water, it's not going to stay there. But if you put it in a pan of cold water and slowly heat it, the frog doesn't know he's supposed to get out. And I think that's basically the way the industry has responded to this change of IC geometries that as they got smaller, it happened in little bits and pieces. And we continue to use the same methodology and just basically we're lulled into submission to accept the fact that you're going to see some failures. So as these devices have been made smaller and smaller, driven by the need for faster uh, clock speeds and lower costs, because the smaller the transistors, the more die per wafer you can get and the lower cost. So uh, that is one of the things that drove us there. So but even now you can you go to buy a microcontroller, it'll be in some small geometry, 55, 28 nanometers. You can buy it for you know 30 or 40 cents. It's got uh, all kinds of wonderful features in it, but the the part is switching in 100 picoseconds or faster on the core. So suddenly you've got this very high speed device that you're trying to use in a two layer board or some low cost product, and you find that you're just not able to make it compliant because you don't have the right three dimensional structure to manage energies that are being generated and switching at that high frequency. So the, kind of the crossover point is in the days where things were just basically defined as a percent of shrink from integer design rules, which were how they designed the transistors. It was the, the photolithography process that was used for developing these parts. You know, if something was 180 nanometers or 120 nanometers, or 90 nanometers, then you had to have a problem. If it was, you know, 65% of IDR, they were so large still that the physical structures in your system <clears throat> were not large enough relative to the switching speed of the transistors to cause any problems. But once you get to nano, which is what Ralph said was the, the danger point, then you really have to start looking at the behavior of the fields and using guidelines that are based on the physics. So if you're switching in nanoseconds or your geometries are described in nanometers, you absolutely have to adopt these rules that I'm going to try to present to you. At the same time, we've been pushing the IC geometries into smaller and smaller. You know, there are two nanometer parts out there right now. The EMC standards have changed. So the compliance is required at a lower frequency than ever before, at a higher frequency than ever before. And then the amount of radiant emissions is allowed is has been continually reduced while you have to be able to withstand a larger amount of interference and still function. So we're building parts that are better at making noise and are much more sensitive and the same time that the compliance re requirements are much more extensive. So everything's changed. The playing field and the equipment have changed. It's a complete new ball game. And the result is the status quo across the industry, and this is no matter whether you're in automotive you know, or a billion dollar company designing products or if you're in a, a garage shop where you're developing two or three products to sell these EMC requirements, typically my customers admit that they will take three to five times spinning the circuit board before they get compliance. Each time they redo the design and submit it for compliance testing, they are not convinced that it's going to pass. So it's all done with you know smoke and mirrors and crossing fingers and hoping and praying instead of from solid engineering. And this again has become the status quo. Billions of dollars are wasted every year by well-meaning, competent teams who design systems without following the rules that are based on the physics. They're following the guidelines based on what didn't cause it to fail from the past. And 
not budgeting for the time or cost it takes to do these iterations of the system design. So when you do your next, when you fail EMC, you go design a new circuit board as fast as you can. You push the design fa through fabrication, so you pay expedite charges. You beg for time in the assembly line and try to get them built in a hurry, and then beg for time in the chamber, still without a lot of confidence that you're going to pass. And this happens two, three, four, five times. So instead of developing new products, these teams are working really hard to get the current product out the door, spending money they hadn't put in the budget, and it falls directly to the bottom line. All of this expense is taking away from the corporate profits. And if the stockholders knew about this, I think there'd be a big rev revolution because this is not engineering. This is just, you know, praying that you're going to work. There are good methods for making these boards work. And instead of paying for multiple respins, it would be a lot more effective to pay for your engineers to go to training classes at conferences, hire industry experts to come and teach you how to do this correctly so that you don't spend all your money and time fixing products that you should have been already shipping to your customers and working on your next generation products. So far, I have been looking for universities that teach the connection between electromagnetic field physics and the electrical engineering program. And I've only been able to identify three so far, and I've been teaching classes now for about 10 years. And it's, it's pretty sad, and we'll get into a little bit of why I think this is true, but the, the original source of good connection between physics and electrical engineering was at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. They have a consortium that they work with companies uh, to build and uh, test physical structures. So they really are proving <clears throat> the concepts of how do you design a circuit board that's compliant both from a signal integrity and from an EMC perspective. And you'll find that most of the really good EMC consultants are graduates from this university. Clemson was added to the list when one of the principal researchers at Missouri, Dr. Todd Hubing, became the endowed chair of the Michelin Automotive Technology Center at Clemson. So they had the field-based perspective that Dr. Hubing was teaching. Recently, I found that Grand Valley State University in Western Michigan also has made that connection because they are working in cons cons with a an EMC a consulting firm in that in Grand Grand Valley's area, and I found that these the team that are doing that are all graduates from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. So the this is all spun off from engineers that have been graduated from Missouri and most of the other universities don't really make an attempt to connect the fields to the electrical engineering and it's because nobody seems to care. The Their customers, which are one, the engineers who pay to come to the school and two, the companies that hire these engineers have not complained. They haven't asked them to change the product. They don't go to the companies, don't go to the universities and say, we need you to change the skill set that you're providing to your graduating engineers because they aren't able to do the job completely. And until that happens, they have no financial reason to want to change their product. They don't want to invest in new textbooks or teaching new curriculum. They want to continue with their status quo because nobody's given them a reason to change. Ralph went to Stanford and asked if he could teach some classes there based on field physics, and they told him that they didn't want him to do that because they didn't want to have to try to change their training methodology. So all of my mentors were deeply embedded in circuit theory until I met Ralph, and almost every rule we were taught are based on 
what didn't make it fail. And so therefore, most of them are wrong and they will cause you to fail EMC. The way I was able to get the training was I started at PCB West and went to some classes there. And let me tell you, I, I did a two day class with Rick Hartley the first time I took a signal integrity class. And five minutes into his class, I knew that everything I'd ever designed worked by accident instead of on purpose. And that's not exactly where you wanna be as a senior engineer. And I just remember thinking, you know, I just hope my manager doesn't find out that I've been just sort of lucky and it, it really wasn't a good place to be. So that started me on a mission where I definitely needed to learn how to design things correctly. Um, so these conferences are, are in existence, PCB East and PCB West in the US. The IEEE EMC Society hosts events around the US, I'm not sure about internationally, uh, where they try to contact signal integrity specialists and have them teach classes. I've done a number of these events. There's a, something called EMC Week where I get together with three other signal integrity engineers and we present a whole week of training. Uh, I've been teaching at DesignCon Embedded Systems Dry World Conferences for a number of years. And then what I try to do is to host classes for well, anywhere in the industry I can. I try to host classes for our internal designers and for our, uh, our customers. And now, gladly adding to this list, PCB Africa, in, in Dr. Obing's effort to help bring the science back to electrical engineering so that the engineers who are able to access this training are going to have a better chance of becoming successful in their designs. So the myths and folklore were what I was deeply embedded in my brain. And like I said, the old rules of thumb just don't apply. And we really have to change what we're doing in order to match the science. And the results are you get compliance with your design. It works. So when I went to my first PCB West, it was a, a fortunate series of, of accidents, I believe. I was working on an advanced design for a pre-silicon emulator that I had to do for one of my customers that would allow them to do fully uh, compliant testing of their design. So it was form factor in circuit emulation so they could design their PC board with the footprint and IO structure of a device that didn't exist. In fact, it was um, almost a year and a half away that they could develop their hardware and software in, in before the silicon was going to be available. I had been a designer in the Motorola tools group, and we had a, a design standard called the Motorola Active Probe Interface, which defined how connectors move signals from board to board, is we had board stacks that we used in our emulators, and it had segmented analog grounds and analog signals and digital signals. And as I was working with the service bureau that was doing the, the PCB layout, uh, I was trying to enforce this standard. And the lead designer there said, you know, you really don't want to do that. This isn't going to work. And I, I said, you know, what do you mean? This is the Motorola standard. You've been using this for 10 years. You're working for me. You will follow these rules. And he went, no, you don't really want to do it that way. It's not going to work. And I said, what do you, it, it has to work. It's always worked. I'm a senior engineer. You need to listen to me. He said, no, you really need to do it differently. And you need to go to some single integrity training so you won't be fighting with me. And he went, no, I don't need training. I got 25 years of experience. And he said, yes, you do. And the training's in California. And in my poor little brain, I went, I think I need training. It's in California. So I went to my manager and said, you know, we were at the time we were moving into the 90 nanometer world. And I didn't realize exactly how profound that was. But I knew that my customers were having trouble with, you know, TTL, they couldn't pass EMC already. So if we give them something switching in a 90 nanometer 
I see that I knew there were just going to be more and more problems. So uh, just a, a note, this guy is uh, now a really good friend of mine. And we later found out our birthdays were the same day. We're both Scorpios, which is why he was just as stubborn as I was teaching me that I needed to go for the training. And I took the uh, Rick Hartley two day signal integrity class, and that's where I five minutes into the class, I knew that everything I did was wrong. And that started me on a mission to try to not only learn the real guidelines and the rules that I needed to know for my printed circuit board designs and to the point where I could share that with my customers because in an applications engineer, my job is to help them be successful in their design and there didn't seem to be anyone we could turn to for help in the EMS. Critical, and there are solutions that work. The hardest part for me to accept was the idea that geometry is the most important thing to know. The geometry of the IC and then the geometry of your printed circuit board. And those things as a digital designer who was good at wire wrapping boards and I could do Boolean algebra and I could do great circuit designs on a schematic. I didn't have to think about geometry, so therefore it was really hard for me to believe that it was important. So electronics, what are what is this? So my digital perspective, ignoring fields, was that you know fields were invisible. Fields had to be well behaved because I didn't care about them. Fields follow the traces because that's what people seem to think. They don't go into open spaces. They are somebody else's problem, which was my favorite perspective. They're only important RF and power supply designs. My friends did that, but I didn't. Or that fields were for farmers. And this whole perspective is kind of a funny way of looking at the idea that we didn't care. We, we were looking at circuits and currents and wires and loops and things that sounded cool, but really weren't anything close to reality. So electricity, we, we talk about volts and amperes or electric and magnetic fields. Volts and amperes are really simple because it's algebra. You can measure voltage with a voltmeter. You can measure current with an amp meter, and it seems to be something that's very straightforward. But what we're measuring isn't what we were taught. We aren't measuring electrical pressure with voltage. We're measuring the field density per unit volume. So it's how much field is in that space. It occupies the space. Amperes, we're not measuring the flow of electrons through a wire. We're measuring the electromagnetic field passing through or next to a spot that we're using to measure it. That's the electric and magnetic fields. So the, the voltage and the current measurements were artifacts that were created by the fields either being stable or moving. So to go a little farther, if you want to measure voltage, you use a voltmeter and you take your voltmeter with your two leads, you hook it up to the circuit board and you see instantly on the meter five volts. So to a human, it seems instant, but in reality, it takes time, many milliseconds, for the field density in the space formed by your two wires to match the field density on the board. So it's not instant, it takes time for the field to move into that space and achieve equilibrium. So that's one of the missing pieces in circuit theory is the idea of time and the amount of field that it takes to do some of the things you need to do. So to take it a little farther, you can look at changes in voltage over time with an oscilloscope. So you take your scope probe and touch it to a place on the board. You take your three inch long uh, ground wire, plug it in there, and you see changes in voltage over time. Very useful to see how things are working. But it's still, You've got a little space there that has to be uh, filled with field. So the limitation on the uh, 
speed at which you can see a signal change isn't limited by the, the scope so much as it is the physical size of that space. So if I wanted to look at very fast signals, I always was taught use a FET probe. And I, in my naive perspective, said, oh, it works better because FETs are faster. You know, that's what's supposed to be happening. But the reality was that on a FET probe, you have a really, really short piece of copper that's your connection to ground. So you put the signal trace and the ground trace are very small. It can see faster changes in signals because the space that you have to fill is much, much smaller than with the three inch lead. And it's all about that time. How much time does it take to fill that space with electromagnetic field? And how much field does it take to fill that space? So the smaller the space is and the shorter the length of the space is, the faster you can add or remove field from that space. So the idea here is to get you thinking about the dielectric, the space that the field moves in is absolutely the rest of your world. So we use volts and amperes because it's simple algebra. And it's an, a sideways look at the electric and magnetic fields. So we look at systems, most people seem to be focused on the clock speed. You know, it's a 200 megahertz or it's a three gigahertz signal. All of those pulse recurrence times are not what determine how you have to treat the fields. What's most important is how fast are these switches turning on and off. If you have a switch turning on once a year, but it switches in a nanosecond, you have a gigahertz signal, and you have to design both the transmission line where the signal is going to be delivered through and the power supply for the gigahertz. So I, I have customers all the time. Well, I'm only using a two megahertz clock, but I've got all these problems that, you know, gigahertz. It says, how fast is the clock switching? It's switching in a nanosecond. Well, you've got a gigahertz signal. It just happens every, you know, at a two megahertz re return rate. So I don't care how often it hurts. I care how much it hurts. So that most important frequency when you're designing both your transmission lines and your power supplies for these systems is the switching speed of the transistors that you're trying to use. Okay, I always want to put up Maxwell's equations because Maxwell and his peers, these, these people had such incredible leaps of faith and intuition to even be able to understand these things. They had very crude instrumentation, you know, basically stone knives and bear skins in order to come up with these concepts. And while I put these up here, we don't have to understand these equations. Although my mentor, Ralph Morrison, could spend all day teaching you what these actually mean. But the idea is that this was some of the foundation of our, our industry and we have to take this on faith unless you want to become a physicist um, which is really the fun math that everybody doesn't want to do so the idea is that maxwell is smart but you don't have to understand this very deep calculus in order to be able to understand the behaviors of fields so the most important thing to take away here, though, is that the Maxwell's equations are about the interaction between electric and magnetic fields. They're not talking about electrons or holes. It's about the fields. And that was the basis of the science. You know, if it was all about electrons moving, how would the fields move through space? This is the thing that I felt embarrassed when I under finally understood. Everybody believes in radio. I mean, radio works, we have radios, we have televisions, we have cell phones. All this is electromagnetic field. For some reason, when we use that same energy on a printed circuit board, because it is still electromagnetic field energy, then it suddenly became electrons moving in wires. And, and we didn't seem to have a problem with that. All our lives, we were always shown in our experience that 
electromagnetic fields could and do move through space. And then we become electrical engineers and we design conductors for the electrons to flow in. And, and that's why everything fails. It's, it's not electrons flowing in wires. It's electromagnetic fields moving through spaces. And if we don't design the space where we want this field to be in, then it doesn't follow our direction. It follows the directions based on the physics that control their behaviors. If it was true, there wouldn't be radio and <laughs> There wouldn't be any way for light to get here from the sun because light is still electromagnetic field energy. You know, we wouldn't even be alive if what we thought was true in electronics. So this is where this complete change in philosophy, both in our minds and what's being taught in the universities has to change because otherwise the result is again, what the status quo has become. Everybody expects to fail EMC. That's not engineering. If something fails, you analyze it, figure out why it fails, and then identify what needs to be changed in order to have it work properly. And that isn't throwing a ferrite or an inductor on a circuit board and praying that it will pass. We're going to talk about how you can really understand what's going on, how you can identify what you need to do to change it and be confident that when you go for your retest that it's gonna pass. So first thing is the idea of current flow. Current doesn't flow in a loop and it doesn't flow in the wires. A flowing, water flowing in a river doesn't flow in the banks, it flows between the banks. The banks of the river give the boundaries where the water is going to move. And then the water seeks the lowest level where the gravity pulls it. It's a quantity, gallons per minute, flowing past a certain point in the river. Current flow is a measure of field energy moving past a point in the transmission line. It's an amp is a coulomb of field energy in a second passing by a point in, the, in space. So it's not got anything to do with the conductors. The conductors act like the banks of the river. They show the field energy where it needs to go. So this is what has to be brought into your brains and held tightly. When you turn on a water hose, the water doesn't go out of the other end instantly. It flows from the water faucet to the end of the hose, stays inside the hose, but it takes time for it to get from one end to the other. Something physical, like propane gas, you can't see it, but when you turn on the gas tank, the gas moves into the hose, into your heater or whatever you're using. It's exactly the same for electromagnetic field. You're trying to design the plumbing that takes the field from where it is to where you want it to be. This is something that I've been able to finally put together to take all this magic that I was taught in these classes and I started going to PCB West every year after the first year I've been. And I would take every class I could during my time there. And I would come away just about as confused as I started. Because there were some things that the, the instructors said, said that were the same, but then everybody else, they would all say things that were different. They seemed to contradict each other. And that made it really hard to figure out which were the facts and which were the, the, the lore based on the individual's experience. And everybody was you know, really trying to teach things that they felt was be useful. But depending on when they were active in the industry, they had experience that was based on different geometries of ICs. So typically the older the instructor was, 
the the farther back in time his re experience was related to the geometry of the switches. So some of the things they would say would be correct, but a lot of the things were things that worked for them, but were not correct. They were just didn't weren't so bad that they caused failures. So finally, I was able to distill this from all the stuff that I was learning from PCB West and other conferences that I've attended and Ralph's patient 15 years of beating on my brain with field physics. So it's these simple concepts. There's three, three rules of three. To contain field, you only need two conductors and a space. So three things. And if you have charge in this space, what has happened is that one of these conductors has been depleted of electrons and achieves a positive charge, and the other conductor has had the electrons from the other conductor put into it, so it has a negative charge. So that depletion field has created an electromagnetic field in this space, and while it's contained, there's no new conductors connected, then this field will stay carefully and quietly in this space because there's no reason to change this displacement of electrons. And it's it's not a whole lot, it's just a few electrons. So the energy still is all represented by the field. You only get three components in your system design. You get conductors, spaces, and a switch. That's it. There isn't anything else. The most complicated microprocessor is just a billions of switches. Those switches perform one function to add or remove spaces where the field is allowed to move to or stop moving to. You turn the switches on, it moves. And so as this switch closes, it will allow the field store on the left side to start moving into the space to the right. And then finally, you can only do three things with field energy. You can store it, you can move it, or you can convert it to kinetic energy. You can drive a motor, you can make a speaker make noise, you can vibrate the molecules in a filament of a light bulb to make it glow and you can see it. You can transmit it into space, but there's nothing else you can do with field energy. So you just need three things to hold it. You only get three components and you can only do three things with it. This isn't rocket science. They made it seem that way. This stuff is really simple. You accept these rules and you apply them to your designs. The magic is that it works because fields are very, very predictable. They always do the same thing. The laws of physics are constant in our world. This is how things work. When I have a design, one conductor I call the continuous conductor. This is what we call ground. From the power supply source to the load, this conductor has to be continuous. No broken grounds, no any silly stuff, no special analog ground 42. One conductor from the source of the energy to where you're going to deliver it. Next to that is a continuous dielectric. So the dielectric next to the ground conductor is where you want your field energy to move through. So this from the switch to the load, you from the source to the load, you have to be able to see a continuous dielectric and a continuous conductor the entire path. This is now bounded because you need two, two conductors and a space to control field. This is the switched conductor. So this is starts at the power supply. This dielectric is in the space between the switched conductor and ground. You get to the first switch. This may be a voltage regulator. This may be a switching power supply. It could be a relay, something that breaks this path this conductor so that it doesn't allow the field to see this new space. So anything that breaks this conductor, and this is how we can move field 
from the source where we have lots of field and we use this field to do work on our circuit board to go to other places on the board. As the switch starts to close, there's some kind of magical event that happens, and this is kind of cool. As this, if this is a semiconductor, it really isn't completely open. It's already kind of conducting because semiconductors are a little leaky. So there's some field moving, but very little. As the switch goes from a high, high resistance to a low resistance, what happens is this field starts to see a conductor space, this conductor and this conductor, these guys have not been depleted yet. So as the field, as this conductor starts, the switch starts to close, the field can now see a metal or a conductor that hasn't been depleted. So as it sees that, the depletion action happens. So there's a displacement current of some of the charge moving from the one conductor to the next. And that lets the field start to move forward into this space. So the field starts to see this place, this non-displaced material. It has the charge start to move from one to the other, and that creates the field that now starts to move into this space. It's not magic or rocket science. This is really, really simple to understand. Once the field, the switch is completely closed, then the field will continue down this path because it, as long as it sees undepleted metal, it's going to continue to, to cause the displacement current to move through this space. Now, one thing to let to remember when you turn the switch on, this field doesn't have a clue what's at the other end. There's no magic current flows and loop stuff happening here. It sees an open space because the depletion event hasn't occurred, and the field goes as fast as it can based on the material itself, and it goes with a large amount as possible to flow through this space. So for all intents and purposes, this field sees a short circuit. Everything that can possibly move through this space based on the material of the dielectric and the distance between the conductors and the width of the switch conductor will move through this space without any idea of what's at the other end. So there's no current flowing a loop. This is you turned on the water faucet and the water's moving through the hose trying to get to the other end. And at the other end, if the if you've got a sprayer that's open, the water will now go out the sprayer if the sprayer is closed, it'll fill the hose up and then it'll stop moving. Same thing with field. When I open the switch, now this field doesn't see any depleted area because it can't get there. There's no two continuous conductors separated by a space. We, When you break one of the three elements needed for containing field, the field stops moving. The field on the right will continue to move based on whatever's at the other end. If, it's, if the hose sprayer is turned off, then it will fill up the space, it'll achieve equilibrium, and it'll stop moving. If the hose sprayer is on, for example, there's a, another gate at the other end, or you're driving a motor or turning on a light bulb, this field will continue to move into that space, into the new space, or be converted into kinetic energy until the field is consumed in this space not rocket science, but you got to remember that you have two things that are already defined in your design, and you can never break these two apart, the continuous conductor and the continuous dielectric. The only thing you have to worry about is how do I design the switched conductor so that it bounds the continuous dielectric properly so that I know where the field is going to move from where it starts at to where I want it to go to do work on my board. So we were not really specifically taught that we generate products that we develop products that generate control and consume electromagnetic field energy. You know, it's not electrons moving in wires. It's not current flowing in a loop. It's the wires that carry the energy. No, fields are the, everything. Switches add new spaces. 
and the moving field carries the energy. It takes time for the stuff to move from where it is to where it needs to be. And again, the field doesn't have any idea of what's at the other end until it gets there. You know, it's it's just the way things work. And this field energy moving through the space is the current flow. Just another note at this point. If if there was a if there's something here, you know, th there is some charge flowing in a loop that as the field's moving, there is the movement of positive, of negative charge from conductor to conductor. So there is current, there is this charge flow that people think of as current flow, but it doesn't carry the energy. The energy's in the field. So there is sort of charge flowing in a loop when you finally get to the load, but it isn't the current. That's a, it's the current that's important is the field not the little bit of charge that's flowing in a loop. But it doesn't start flowing in a loop until the field gets to the other end. So again, this isn't what I was taught. It's not what I practiced for most of my career. And it's not what you see in a lot of publications. There are books you can buy that tell you about current flow and current loops and uh, you know, follow those and you know what's going to happen. Like I said in the song, if, if you your results are going to be that you're going to fail EMC. So we haven't been taught and need to start thinking about the idea of fields in space. So again, that's why I wrote the song was to create an earworm so that you can start thinking about fields. My goal is that you wake up in the middle of the night screaming. It's all about the space because I do sometimes. So fields do the work. Again, current flow is a measure of the field moving in the space between the conductors that bound them. What does happen though, is the fields interact with the molecules of the conductors. So the outer layers of the crystal lattice of the copper or whatever metal you're using as a boundary label layer, after even though some of the electrons might be moving the charge displacement, but the, the electric field bullies these molecules around in the conductor and causes them to vibrate. So some of the electromagnetic field energy is converted to kinetic energy or heat. And that's the whole idea of voltage drop caused by this resistance. Resistance is a function of how much of the field energy is converted into heat. So if you are using a resistor to drop a voltage, for example, if you've got five volts on one side of the resistor and you have a resist resistor this size so that you have three volts on the other side, it doesn't magically change the field density. Two volts of that energy are being converted into heat interacting with the material in the in the resistor. So when we design a circuit board, the goal is to reduce the amount of interaction between the conductor and the field as it moves through that space. And that's done by making sure that the impedance of the transmission line matches the rate of flow that you need for this energy. So if I need you know, an amp of current to flow through a transmission line, I need to make sure that the impedance, which is a function of the width of the uh, copper trace, and the thickness and material dielectric material can go through it. You know, if I need an amp, but it's only a 50 ohm transmission line, it's going to take a long time to move that current through there. But because I'm running multiple wave cycles through there, what happens is I'm losing a lot of this energy, the voltage drop, because I'm having so much of it interact with the molecules of the conductor and it's being converted to heat. So in our past, you know, oh, I need I need an amp out of this, so I'm going to use two ounce copper. Well, two ounce copper just means it can take more abuse by being heated before the trace curls up off the top of the board. When you add more copper, you haven't increased the capacity of that transmission line. 
It can't carry any more energy just because you made it thicker, any more than you can take a, a one inch pipe made out of rubber and then replace it with a one inch pipe made out of steel. You still can't get any more water through it, even though you made the walls stronger and thicker. It's all determined by the geometry of the space. So I never use high weight copper unless I need it for mechanical reasons and for thermal dissipation. That's mechanical energy. I want to take the kinetic energy that's resulted from a switch heating up and give it another mechanical structure to be connected to so that it can take that heat and diffuse it. But it has nothing to do with managing the electromagnetic field. I don't use heavy copper, right? You know, it, it's a waste of money and it makes it more difficult to, to fabricate your printed circuit boards. You need to increase the current carrying capacity. You don't make the vias bigger and you don't make the copper thicker. You add or correct the volume of the space in order to match the requirements of the energy flow. So the other thing that happens is it interacts with the molecules of the dielectric too. So there's some of this energy is being converted into heat as well in the dielectric. So unless they're in a vacuum, it's going to, some of the energy is going to be lost as it moves from the driver to the receiver based on the characteristics of that transmission line. The amount of surface area that you're presenting for the conductors and the properties and uh, thickness of the dielectric that you're using to allow the field to move through. The other thing that we are always taught with the wrong perspective is the electromagnetic field energy moves slower in FR4. Electromagnetic field energy always moves at the speed of light. In space, it moves at the speed of light because there's very, very few molecules in there. Field energy doesn't go through molecules. It has to go around them. So in space, there are very few molecules, so it doesn't get slowed down, relatively speaking, because it can go pretty much in a straight line. As it enters the atmosphere, it seems to slow down, but it's because it has a higher molecular density and the field has to go on a longer path. It has to go around each of the molecules in the space, in the air. Once you get into a printed circuit board, the molecular density is even greater, so it has to go around even more. So the path it takes is longer and longer and longer. So it seems like it is moving slower, but it's because it has a longer travel distance. So again, this is not mystery and magic. It always behaves the same. And then just another note, the crystal lattice of the conductor works because the fields can't go between the molecules in the metal conductors. It can go through dielectrics because their molecular structure and their crystal, or they're not a crystal lattice like you have in metals. So the fields can't go through metals. They only interact with the outer few layers of the molecules in that crystal. So how do fields behave? This is a great slide from Ralph that I use all the time. So in this case, we've got the two, two conductors in a space, the three elements for storing charge. So we've got a metal sphere that's completely closed. Inside is a conductor, and if there's charge in here, it would be between the outer surface of the inner conductor and the inner surface of the outer conductor. The field is in that space between the conductors. On the outside of this, because there are no holes, because you have to have a space for field to move, none of this charge can escape. So there's no charge outside the sphere as a result of the charge that's inside the space. Same thing in a coax. If I've got a good coax, the shield will keep the field in the space between the outside of the center conductor and the inside of the shield. Now, once we have a hole, things start to be different. 
here's the same sphere, there is now a hole, and there is another conductor somewhere. So as a result of the rules of physics, now between the outer surface of the inner conductor and the outer surface of this conductor outside of the sphere, there will be shared charge. So that's the rule between any and every pair of conductors, there will be shared charge. So to take it to the extent, so between these two conductors, there's shared charge. Between the surface of this inner conductor and wires in your wall, there will be shared charge. Between this conductor and airplanes flying overhead, there will be shared field. Between this conductor and satellites in orbit, between this conductor and Antares, there will be shared charge because the rule is between every pair of conductors, there will be shared charge. The reason things work at all is because the magnitude of that field is reduced by the square of the distance. So we're lucky that there's at least something there because we don't get fully contained structures to use on our circuit boards. So for normal things, you think about your printed circuit board, thousands and thousands of conductors, all of them are sharing bits of every signal and power supply on the board are all intermixed to some extent. So this is the reality of our world. And that's where as the switches get faster and faster and the wave fronts start to get smaller and smaller, because it's about that surface area of the wave front and the, the density per square area of the displacement current that causes all the evil things to happen. So to go a little farther with this, if I've got traces over a plane, according to the law, most of the field energy is going to be between the bottom surface of the trace and the top surface of the ground plane. Now, there will be some interaction between the edges of the foil and each of these traces. That's the law. However, what dominates the field's presence is the surface area. So the amount of surface area on the bottom of the trace relative to the surface area on the edge where it's just the thickness of the foil is so different that most of the field is going to want to be here, plus the distance between these, although it could be very close relative to the thickness of the dielectric, the surface area is still going to dominate. So most of the energy is always going to be here. If I have another trace on the other side of the plane, in my original teachings, I was always told you can't route sensitive analog anywhere near digital signals because it'll interfere with the analog signal. And this is a rule that came about our failure to understand the real world. If there's not a hole, remember, you have to have a hole for the field to go through and another conductor to give that path for the field to move through, it doesn't magically appear on the other side of this through this copper. So I can route anything I want over here and it's going to be relatively safe from anything happening on the top of the board. Unless I put a hole in here. We had problems and came up with these rules because we didn't give the signals their own space. Everything was already spread out all over the place. So when we try to route something special, we didn't give the analog signal its dedicated transmission line. We didn't give the digital signals a dedicated transmission line. So of course they messed with each other. They were allowed to occupy the same space. So changes in one signal would cause changes in the other and vice versa. It's, it's because we did a terrible job and we came up with band-aids that became the rules of law and they are wrong and they will cause you to have failures. Now, one little caveat is it's not quite true that you're isolated completely on the other side of the plane because the law says the field will go around the edge of the plane and find its way to this conductor. That's just the way it is. The only saving grace is you get about 200 dB of separation between the top and the bottom of a plane. So for most applications, it's not going to be an issue. If you need something that's greater than that, then you just have to make sure that the transmission lines are isolated better, and there's ways to do that. 
So energy management, we're going to talk about the most important thing. So this is energy, electromagnetic field energy. So some of our favorite components to use are capacitors. A capacitor is a ge geometry that concentrates and stores field energy. It's two conductors separated by a dielectric. In the case of most capacitors, this dielectric is very special. It has a capability of storing much higher densities of field per cubic centimeter than the FR4 or the board. So these materials can store huge amounts of energy. The only other thing is that they have a dielectric constant that's more in order instead of four like a PC board where the energy effectively moves at half the speed of light. The dielectric constants are more like the order of 20 or 30,000. So it takes a long time for the energy to get from the pins of the capacitor to the end of the plates and then back into the circuit board. So we take this capacitor and we hook one of the one of the conductors to the power supply switched conductor and one of the conductors to the continuous conductor or ground and it presents a space in parallel with our transmission line that has a much lower impedance so the energy wants to fill that space up that's why it acts like a, a lake between two rivers for the water to get from one side of the from one place to the other side of a lake the lake has to fill up first and then it flows into the next river or a reservoir for a a, a dam it has to fill the dam up and then be able to flow over into the next part so it's very straightforward. It's a great big bucket that stores charge that's in in parallel with your your design. Inductors we were always taught were these magical things that resisted changes in voltage or current. But inductor is just a a, a wire that's bunched up. So it presents you, you replace one part of the switch conductor with an inductor. What it does is creates a much larger space in series with that transmission line, and it takes more energy and it takes longer to fill that space that's created between the inductor itself and the ground plane than it would if there was just a trace. So it takes a while to fill it up. So it seems to resist changes in voltage. So, because you can't see the field on the other side of the inductor until it fills up the space that's there. And then when you stop sourcing energy to that space and there's a load on it, it's there's a lot of energy stored in that space. So now it tends to continue to flow energy into that space. So it seems to resist changes in current, but it's not magic. It just creates a larger space that takes time for the energy to flow through. So I think of them more as uh, wire stretchers. It adds travel time to the waves. And it's it, because it's a structure that is defining, you know, two conductors separated by a space is a way to store energy. So that's how they behave. There's no magic here. It's very straightforward. It, they follow the simplest laws of physics that we're talking about. So why does the energy follow the conductors? It's the same reason that water flows downstream. So you have one point where the water is higher, so it has more potential energy than the other end. The, the stream bed gives a way to connect the top, you know, the high point to the low point, and gravity pulls the water down. The idea of fields following the path that we define is because the less energy it takes to fill the space and the higher the density of the displacement current is, the more the energy wants to follow that path. And it starts with the idea that free space is an impedance of 377 ohms. So a 180 degree space is 377 ohms. So it, it's the max it can fill. As you start to move the conductors closer together, the amount of space that's being used is smaller, so it takes less energy to fill that space. And field loves that. And again, it's all about increasing that density of the displacement current as a field moves into the space. 
until you get to the point where ever it's lower. So it wants to go to the lowest impedance because it takes less field to fill that space and get achieve that uh, field density that matches the source of the energy. So it follows the path of lowest impedance, which is again a function of the distance between the conductors, the uh, material characteristics, and the width of the trace. That tells you how much your plumbing can handle. What is the capacity of this space that you're creating? This is the idea of a transmission line. Any two conductors separated by a space form a transmission line. You connect it to a source of energy and you connect it to a load that gives the plumbing for the field. In general, any pair of wires, any pair of conductors is a transmission line. In our designs, these need to be a special transmission line where one of the conductors is the continuous conductor, ground. Next to that is the dielectric, and adjacent to that is your transmission line cap, the switched conductor. So in our designs, it's not just randomly any pair of conductors, it's a signal or a power supply, which are the switched conductors adjacent to the ground. So again, two pieces of the puzzle are already defined. All you have to do is properly manage the switched conductors, and then you have a system that will behave properly. But we still have that rule. There will always be field between coplanar traces, and there will always be field between any and every signal trace on the board. By designing good transmission lines where one of the conductors is a ground plane, with the dielectric next to it, you're going to give the field a place where most of it is going to be. And that's the best we can do until we get coaxial connections. It's always the, the goal is to design a space defined by conductors you've chosen so that most of the energy moves from where it is to where it's going. And it has to be enough so that you can actually accomplish your goal. It has to be designed so that you can move enough energy. If you need an amp, that transmission line has to be structured so that it has the capacity for one coulomb per second. If it's to have a trace, uh, a transmission line for a high speed signal, we need to make sure that most of that signal gets to the other end without causing too much damage to other signals near it or being damaged too much by others so that it still carries the same information when it gets from the driver to the receiver, uh, an analog voltage. So it's still close enough to the original voltage that you can actually do the measurements and make the choices in your signal system controls algorithms. That's what we have to do. The, the one thing about transmission lines is they are where we provide the lower impedance path for the energy than free space. They store energy, we showed that. Any two conductors separated by a space can store energy. Where they are at a circuit is critical because you need to match this transmission line to the type of energy you're trying to move and where it needs to move. The uh, crosstalk occurs at the wave front. And this is because as the electric field is changing, so you have a changing E field, it's going to cause a changing magnetic field in the signal or switch conductor. Um, it doesn't do much to the ground plane because it's just too huge and the magnitude of the change of the E field is small relative to that size of conductor. But it will, however, in the switch conductor, the signal conductor, induce a magnetic field that's changing as the changing electric field moves through the space, the wavefront. This changing electric field changes, creates the changing magnetic field. The changing magnetic field will then cause a changing electric field in the nearby dielectric. So that's in the space between that conductor and the nearest conductor in the board structure. 
this changing electric field will now cause a changing magnetic field in that conductor, which will then cause a changing electric field in the other transmission line. And that's where the crosstalk has. So you're losing energy, but you're also affecting the nearby signals. And depending on the uh, magnitude of that wavefront's energy, the, the switching speed, it will cause uh, the greater impact, the faster it's switching, the greater impact it will have because it's creating a much denser, much quicker change in the magnetic field, and that will cause higher levels of crosstalk in the adjacent signals. So there's no magic here again. Things are changing. They cause other things to change. The energy is delivered at the termination. So wherever there's a point where it changes geometry, it will do something. Energy goes both directions in these transmission lines. There can be multiple waves in the same path. And they can radiate again because we have this issue with the, the wave front inducing the magnetic field in the switch conductor, which starts that propagation of the field and changing back and forth between electric and magnetic fields as it moves through the board of structure. So we use them to transport energy and logic signals. So you need to make sure you have good transmission lines that match the job they're supposed to do. So if you have to worry about crosstalk, you get the beauty of the square of the distance. If things are critical, they're switching very fast, and you have to worry about making sure that you reduce the amount of crosstalk, you make them farther apart. If it's twice as far apart, you get one fourth the energy between the two signals because it takes that much more energy to fill the space. Simple, simple, simple. So every, every circuit is really transmission lines. So again, the switched conductor has to be next to the continuous conductor or ground. And then as the energy moves through the space, whenever the geometry of the transmission line changes, it will cause a reflection because the energy will see a different space. If that space is a lower impedance, then you will have a drop in voltage and it will create a negative reflection. If the energy is finding a uh, change to a higher impedance, it will now reflect a positive uh, wave and it will behave according to that. And all this takes time for it to move from place to place, just like water moving through your hoses or your pipes in your house. So we're going to get into the waves now. Power supply transmission line properties. Okay, fundamental to every system, the most critical net on every design is the power supply, not clocks, not oscillators, the power supply. If you don't have a solid power supply design, then it will cause problems with all of your signals. Most of the EMC issues that I work on are tracked directly back to poor power supply design. The issues are not caused by the outputs of the IOs, they're caused by the depletion waves that are being created when you turn on a switch. The depletion wave is the drop in voltage adjacent to the switch that goes back upstream to the power supply to find energy. And if those depletion waves are not fed properly quickly enough, then that's where you get the problems with radiated emissions. Energy comes from sources and it's all based on how far away they are from the switch, which is in turn the time it takes to go there and come back with the energy. So it starts with on die capacitance. Then there's some energy stored in the package itself. Then the first thing you have any control over will be the local decoupling capacitors. And then finally off into the power supply. And like I say it takes time for this energy to move. And this is basically the idea. It's about six inches per nanosecond on a printed circuit board. And all this energy moves in waves 
um, from the first time the switch is turned on because it doesn't, you know, it hasn't filled the space yet. So when you turn on a switch, if it's a nanosecond switch, you have a, a wavefront that's sourcing energy into the transmission line at a gigahertz. The same thing happens because the source of energy to the transistor is not the same impedance as the output. So you have a drop in voltage that's at a nanosecond or a gigahertz. So the sourcing wave goes one way, the depletion wave goes the other way until, and this, you know, they travel until they find a change in geometry. So the signal goes down the transmission line until it hits the other end. The depletion wave does the same thing. It goes upstream until it finds a change in geometry. And we hope that that's a point where it can get more energy and reflect back and give you power to your system. So this is a thought uh, experiment that Ralph uses in his teaching. So if I've got a, a simple circuit with a 50 ohm transmission line, a five ohm load and a five volt source, this 50 ohm transmission line is capable at five volts to deliver a tenth of an ampere. So how do I get a full amp through that space? Even if it's only a, I, maybe I should say a, a coulomb through this space. Even if the line is a sixteenth of an inch, it takes 10 picoseconds for the wave to go there, 10 picoseconds for it to come back. So 20 picosecond round trip, and it takes 30 round trips to deliver enough energy to finally deliver a full coulomb at the end of the transmission line. So 600 picoseconds to move a coulomb through a sixteenth of an inch. That's because the plumbing is important. So this is what it looks like in the simple circuit here. And what happens when you look at the change in voltage or field density is the first step is, is here. The height of the step is determined by the impedance or the capacity of the transmission line. The length of the step is the round trip between the source and the load. So the first reflection is first wave is giving you this much energy. The second is going to give you not quite twice as much because some of the energy is being consumed by the load, converted to kinetic energy. And then the next will add another just under 33%. And this will continue as until you finally get to the voltage matched at the other end. So this is a series of steps. And it's again based on the the geometry, the physical distance between the supply and the load and the capacity of the transmission line. And this is how everything works. Capacitors. A capacitor isn't a curve like you see in the data sheets. The capacitor has open-ended plates, so it takes a finite amount of time for the wave to get to the end of the plates and reflect back. And it does this until it stores enough energy to match the energy on the outside world. And that's where you get the flow of energy. So if I hit the capacitor with a depletion wave, it's going to unwrap the same way. We're going to pull a little bit of energy out each time and it will supply energy to the load. So the 16th of an inch, it's everywhere. You know, trace to a capacitor, wire bonds, lead frame, traces to vias, you know, at 10 picoseconds now is something that you care about because it's a long time when you're looking at trying to move a lot of energy in a in a transmission line. So again, transmission the capacitors, there are two plates connected on one end to your circuit board and the other end is open. So waves bring the energy into and out of the capacitor. This is the, the, the total hierarchy you see on your system. It starts on the die, because those are the closest points to where the switch is. Then there's a space between the wire bonds, the substrate, power supply planes, which are closer. Your local bypass, the big charge wells close, your bulk storage, and then the power supply. And the distance to each of these is farther and farther, so it takes longer and longer to bring energy from each of these locations. So the highest frequencies are going to be supported by the closest storage areas. Now, 
I went to these classes for a number of years and my managers were always asking me, when are you going to start teaching this? And I kept coming back confused and I'm going, I don't know when I can do that. It's going to be, you know, I don't understand it. I can't teach it. And I kept really trying to, to find a way to do this. And then one day I got a, an email from one of my friends at work and he said, we're going to have a conference in Brazil and you're going to teach a PC board design class. And I thought to myself, I don't have a PC board design class, but I'm going to Brazil. So I said, OK, and put my foot in my mouth and decided that I was going to have to do this. So I sat at my desk and was like, what am I going to do? How do I start? You know, all these people have contradicting perspectives and the different rules. And, and I said, what is the one thing that they talk about that's common? And it was antennas. I said, well, maybe I start with an antenna and figure out just what it ha what it means. And so I made this chart, starts at one hertz and goes to 100 gigahertz. And I started looking at how big the antennas had to be relative to those types of energy frequencies. And then it was like, OK, some of this we don't absolutely care about. You know, at one hertz is six times around the Earth. So that's certainly not systems we're working on. Even at 10 kilohertz, you're looking at, you know, four and a half miles. So where does it start to matter and when do antennas affect a, a electrical system? So I took a look at what this means. Quarter wavelength is, you know, an analog wave is where the voltage is at maximum. So the change in voltage is down to zero, but I've got the highest field density possible. And when you look at what that does as far as filling a space, if I've got a dipole antenna that's a quarter wavelength long, I start sourcing the energy from a 50 ohm source. As it moves into the space between the elements, you know, the, the two conductors, it will gradually see an increasing impedance, but it will continue to fill this space because the energy flows until it sees something to make it stop. When it gets to the end of the quarter wavelength antenna, the maximum amount of field possible is being presented to this space. So it doesn't know it's supposed to stop. It will continue to move. So at that point, I'm now presenting energy as it moves from 376.9999999 ohms into 377 ohms, and the field will now propagate into this space. So that's where a quarter wavelength makes sense and it's important to understand. So when I extracted the parts of this chart that were appropriate to the world that I was familiar with, this is when all the light bulbs started to turn on. When I moved to Detroit in 1987, all the customers were being migrated from the HMOS devices to HCMOS. And all the modules were failing EMC. So you know, I'm out there sitting next to the customer at the chamber. We're cutting traces and adding ferrites and sticking capacitors on and and hoping things would work and and just totally in the dark. And like I say, we even would hire external consultants who would charge a bunch of money. They would spend a month looking at things and give us a list of ferrites and inductors they thought might make a difference with no guarantees. So we're adding a lot of cost. They had absolutely no idea what they were doing because they never looked at the fundamental issues at hand. So when I moved to Detroit in 87, we were going from HMOS to HCMOS. This chart made it all clear. At HMOS geometries, it's switching the rise time and distance or how long it takes to go from zero to one was 100 nanoseconds or 100 feet. So a quarter wavelength was 24 and a half feet. So if, if you didn't have a piece of conductor that was this long, you weren't having any problems. So unless you're working on a tractor trailer, a bus, a train, uh, a, a, a ship, you never had anything long enough to be a rating antenna. Then when we moved to HCMOS, it was an order of magnitude change in the switching speed. So this is all ratio metric. This is why it's so beautiful and so simple. It went from 24 and a half feet to less than three feet. 
guess what's hooked to every automotive module? A wiring harness that's at least three feet long. So we gave them a radio transmitter. They hooked it up to an antenna and nobody could figure out what was wrong. This is, you know, again, we weren't taught about the connection between electromagnetic field science and electronic systems. And as we go through here at a, in the IDRHC mouse, switching in a nanosecond, you know, three inches is a rating antenna. So your board is covered with hundreds of rating intenses because there's lots of signals that are switching in a nanosecond. When you start to get into smaller geometries, you're looking at a lead frame and wire bond being fast long enough to be a rating antenna. So you put a, a 65 nanometer part in a quad flat pack and hook an antenna array to it. So unless you're very careful with how you manage these conductors and the transmission lines, you are going to be faced with many, many sources of radiated emissions. At these smaller geometries, half a via is enough. Structures on the die are large enough to be radiating antennas at two nanometers. You got to worry about the metallization layer and how well that's managed. Because all of these things are ways that energy can be delivered to the outside world. So unless you know, you were working on something that was giant, the, tr the ICs and transistors were switching so slowly that the antennas were huge. And so all these design guidelines were formed basically in this little place in here. We kind of found a place that where the rules were not so bad, it made it fail all the time. Therefore, they must be good. And so that's what caused us to have so much problems. So since the TTL days, it's been a four order magnitude change in the switching speeds of the ICs that we're using. So Ralph was always big on describing orders of magnitude. So this is because I'm automotive centric. I built this little picture at the zero order. We have a vehicle that goes six miles an hour. One order magnitude change means 60 miles an hour. This is a fundamentally different solution than the buggy because the buggy won't go 60 miles an hour unless you put it on the back of a truck or throw it off of a cliff. Two orders is now 600 miles an hour. It's a jet airplane and you're again with a fundamentally different solution. Three orders of magnitude, 6,000 miles an hour. You're in a rocket ship. Four orders of magnitude at 60,000 miles an hour, and you're in an alien spaceship. Only in electronics would we try to make the buggy go fast. We made all of these changes in our geometries over the past 20 years and didn't change the design guidelines. And the results were a gradual acceptance of failure in EMC that is rampant throughout the industry. It's not unique to any one company. It's not unique to any one engineer. It has become the status quo. So energy and logic signals. A, a, a logic signal is just another energy source. So everything is delivering energy. Maybe you only need you know, milliamps or nanoamps on a transmission line, but it's still a source of field energy. So you treat everything the same. It's just another way of taking energy from where it is to where it needs to be. And again, some of this energy is going to be received at the other end, and some of the energy is not. And we're going to talk about how that works. So the bottom line is you have to make sure that every power supply conductor and every signal conductor is adjacent to the continuous conductor or ground. Hopefully you have the ability to have a ground plane. If you don't have that, then you need to have a ground trace next to the signal so that you have a defined space for the field that creates that continuous dielectric that you can see from the source to the load. Anytime you break this rule, it allows signals to share the same space. It will increase radiated emissions degrade signal integrity, and decrease your immunity. And for all intents and purposes, 
once you make these lines uh, intact, the one dielectric rule, then unless you're working with signals that are switching faster than a certain speed, and we'll talk about that next, it will be a good transmission line. So the thing is now, and you have to know at this point exactly what the switching speed is of your IOs, because that tells you what this transmission line needs to look like, whether you need to have a controlled impedance transmission line, or it doesn't need to be because it's what we call lumped or within uh, empirically a quarter wavelength, but I use a sixth wavelength and we'll talk about that. So it's all driven by the geometry of the transistor switch. And you have to make sure that you match this physical space with the behaviors of the switch and the wave front that it can that it creates. So here's the digital world. You've got a square wave and it's comprised of just lots and lots of analog sine waves. So in our world of switching events where you're not looking at antennas, the idea is this half wavelength because it, the switch turns from off to on to off. So the time it takes for the switch to turn from off to on isn't instantaneous. So that, that rise time and the distance it travels during that time is called the rise time distance. And that's what we use to figure out what the exact behaviors are going to be for the, uh, for the system. Especially again, we're, we're concerned about the geometry of the wave front. So this is the table I created based on these lump distances. So again, back to the HMOS days, if the parts were in the same room, they're close enough. So everything was always lumped and we didn't have any problems with the result of the reflection at the receiver side. Even at UDR HCMOS days, it's still a foot and a half. So unless it's a really big board, basically anywhere on the board is close enough. You know, I wire wrapped a 68020 single board computer and it worked just fine. And I thought it was because I was really good. It was because it was all lumps still. There, the parts were close enough together. There weren't any issues. When things are switching in a nanosecond, you have two inches to play with. If you can't put the driver and receiver within two inches, then you have to terminate the transmission line within those two inches and create a controlled impedance trans transmission line, typically 50 ohms. At these smaller geometries and faster switching speeds, such as you find in DDR3, DDR4, CERTES, PCIe, they have to terminate these signals on the die because by the time you get through the wire bond and lead frame, you're way past lump distance and the signal is ringing like crazy. These are the ways that I use. So I desperately try to avoid controlled impedance because it costs board space and more, more components. You know, if I'm trying to route an address data bus on the inner layers of a board and I have to terminate it because the, I'm outside the lump distance, I have to bring the signal from inside the board out to the outside to find the resistor. And I've got to have a signal via and a ground via to create that transmission line. And then on the other side of the resistor, I have to bring it back down into the board stack to the layer I'm routing on again with another via. So I need four vias and a component to, to do uh, termination of a transmission line if I'm in, outside the lump distance. And this is how it behaves, basically. If the impedance of the driver and receiver are the same, the energy flow is constant. There's no reflection because there's the same size hole for the energy to go into. If I go from a high impedance, from a low impedance to a high impedance, what happens is it's like you walk up to a wall with a hole in it and you throw a bucket of water at it, some of the water will go through the hole, but most of it's going to splash back in your face. So as the field moves down the transmission line, again, it doesn't have a clue what's the other end. It's, it's moving as much energy as possibly will flow through that space. It gets to the receiver. Some of the energy goes into the receiver, and the rest of it starts piling up, and it starts to reflect back because as the magnitude or volt field density is higher in this reflected bubble, 
and then what's coming down the transmission line, it now starts to move because it's higher density than what's there. So you've got this positive bubble moving back. And if it's cold far enough away that that bubble exceeds the, the magnitude of the field that's moving in the transmission line, then it will move all the way back to the driver and start a, what's called a ringing event. And it's because there's just no place for the field to go and it wants to find its way to reach equilibrium. If I go from a low high impedance to a low impedance, it's like walking up to a window and throwing the bucket of water out there. All the water goes in and the bucket's empty and now the empty bucket has to go back and find more energy. So it's pretty straightforward behavior. And you say, as, as you turn on the switch, if the distance between the driver and receiver is farther than the lump distance, then you have the full wave going down to the end. Only some of the energy goes in and it doubles itself because you get a doubling of the voltage. So from five volt signal becomes 10 volts. It starts moving back towards the driver until it gets to the driver where it sees a low impedance. Then it drops down again, and this starts a, a depletion wave, which goes this way. And this goes back and forth and back and forth until finally either the energy is absorbed by the, drop, or the receiver, it's converted into heat because of these wave fronts is where it interacts with the molecules, and you start to vibrate the molecules of both the dielectric and the conductor. So you're getting energy that's being converted to heat. And then at the same time, remember where you've got a changing electric field, it causes a changing magnetic field, so you start to get the crosstalk and radiation. Most of this energy, as this, this wave is flowing back and forth, is going to be radiated or inducing crosstalk into the adjacent signal traces. So I, I use the sixth wavelength because the maximum reflection I end up with is 67%. And that gives my layout uh, designers the ability to spread things out a little bit farther and still have meet the lump distance. But if things are not within the lump distance, you've got to put the terminating device inside the lump distance and push, then you get a controlled impedance transmission line. So just a, another thing is between inner and outer traces because the dielectric is different, on the inner traces, it's purely moving in the FR4. On the outer traces, some of the signals moving in the space between the trace and the ground plane, and some of the signals moving in the air. So the travel time for outer traces is less than the travel time for inner traces. So it will move effectively farther. So if you're trying to do timing matching of signals, you need to be aware of this difference in uh, travel time as a result of the, the dielectric that it's traveling in. Now for power supplies, we talked about the need to have the depletion wave go find the energy and move back. So it's a round trip uh, travel from the switch back to the power supply, back to the, the load. And this is the, the table that I use for this. And again, I use all these tables as the guidelines for my designs. The consensus from the experts that I trust and work with is that a good guideline for placement of capacitors is a 20th wavelength. And, and the things to point out about that this is important, it's well within lumped. So there are always going to be reflections, but you don't get ringing because you never get a reflection that's a higher magnitude than the incident wave. So you don't get the, the second order reflection. And you look at the difference in the technologies, in the HMOS days, again, if the capacitor is in the same room, it's close enough. In HCMOS, if it's on the same board, it's probably close enough. At a nanosecond, it needs to be within about a half an inch. The good news is you can do that. You can actually place a capacitor within a half an inch of your device. Once you get to the faster switching smaller geometries, you're too far away, so you're dependent on what the IC vendor has created. And one of the questions I have people ask, you're, you want to ask your vendor if you're using these new technology devices, is how much on-die capacitance is there? Because if they can't answer that question, 
then they didn't do it on purpose. And if they did not do it on purpose, then most likely there isn't enough. And if there are switching noise events, you know, depletion waves that are related to the core and the core switching, there's nothing you can do to prevent that from causing you problems. You're too far away on the circuit board to do anything about it, short of wrapping the thing in metal. So it's a, a cost. You're going to find ICs. You just can't make work depending on your environment. So this 20th wavelength is great. And if you use that as your guideline, you put the first capacitor within a 20th wavelength. You're going to use that as your uh, first mitigation for these depletion waves. So how do you do stuff with it? And when you do a lo board layout, some things you have no control over. Somebody paid for tooling, so you've got a, a, an enclosure of a specific size. The mounting uh, posts are at a certain place. The connectors in a certain place. And whether they make sense or not, you usually don't have any political clout to allow you to cause them to change it. I've seen many times where they went off and built the enclosure, paid millions of dollars for the tooling on the prototype. And then when you go to try to validate the design, it, it isn't going to work with that layout. So you end up having a lot of problems related to uh, the board design, usually adding costs to the board design because the connect the enclosure is now unchangeable, even though it was was based on a design that was not going to be any good for you. So then so you do the predefined stuff because you have no choice. Then you want to add the filter components, I call them. So uh, if there's a wiring harness, until you put a capacitor or a diode or a, a common mode choke, those are wiring harness. So you want to change them from wiring harness to managed conductor as soon as you can. So you place those as close as you're allowed to the conductor so that you can route then a transmission line that has some uh, behaviors already uh, achieving then the power supplies you want to have the voltage regulators as close to the connector as possible because the voltage regulator is a very powerful filter it takes you know outside world energy and makes it so into something that you can use on your circuit board if you're going to switch power if you drive motors you want to make sure that the energy coming onto the board into the switches and off the board is intruding as small as possible area on your board to keep those higher energy movement and the higher magnetic fields that they cause to be making the least impact on your circuit board. So there are other things you want to look into. When you do a uh, schematic, there's really not a whole lot of visibility into what the layout's going to look like. So there has to be a, an interaction at the point when you start importing the database from the schematic into the layout tool to help reduce the complexity. Every time you can reduce a switch over, it reduces the number of vias, reduces the complexity of the design, and improves the overall behavior. And there are some signals that are arbitrarily assigned, like IOs on micros or A to Ds. Those you know, unless they have a specific function on a pin, you should be able to move those around so that it improves the layout. And then so you can change the schematic to make that happen. Even on address and data lines to memories, even on the most complicated memories, only certain bits in each byte channel are required to be coherent. And for some reason, the memory guys don't look at our micro pinouts and match the pins to them. There's always scrambling required. So in order to make it less complicated, figure out which of these signals must be from pin to pin and which ones are just arbitrary. And that'll help you unscramble nets and, and get you to the right place. Because all that matters in the, in the end is that you're always addressing the same cells in the memory each time. And the memory chip doesn't know the difference between A14 and A0 doesn't know the difference between D16 and D4 unless those are control bits. It just knows it wants to send back signals 
from back and forth from the same place. So you can make a big difference in your layout by massaging the schematic to unscramble the nets and improve the whole design. The other thing is when you when you do your schematic, you'll put you know notes on it. Place near U1 is this note. So when you import the database, the, where do the notes go? They disappear. So it's the the responsibility of the circuit designer to communicate to the layout engineer to what things they really need to happen in this design. So that's one of the most important things. You can't throw it over the wall. And then once you get done with the things you have to place, then you get to start placing things on your terms. So you start with the power supply and do all that. And then you put ICs that are the same volt. If you got three volt parts and five volt parts, you try to put those in the same domain so that you can route the power supplies a lot more cleanly. Um, you want to put the power stuff closest to the connectors because the you have shorter transmission lines. It's, it takes less energy and less time to move energy. All the capacitors. And one of the things Dr. Hubing says is you use the largest value capacitor in the smallest package allowed by manufacturing and reliability. And that's the capacitors you place near the switches. And then you work on how things are, are done, whether you need to make things lumped. So again, you need to know the switching speeds of the transistors and you need to know the geometry of the core so you know what to do with these uh, small capacitors in order to support those very small transistors that are switching uh, very fast. So the other thing I want to stress is people seem to want to, to flood planes. I don't use power planes for anything. I use uh, power islands and I route to them and then I use the rest of the layer for circuitry you know, or ground. But one of the things you, you wouldn't want to do is, you know, you don't route a clock all over the board if it needs to go from, you know, from one IC to the other to two inches apart. The same thing with power. People will flood entire sections of a board layer with three volts. Well, if it's not connected to anything, you don't route power where it's not used either, because what you do is allow all these fields to go places where they could cause trouble. So don't spend money on big pieces of power copper that aren't connected to any vias. I use power islands that are, their purpose is to connect the pins of the IC to the pins of the capacitors I'm using to speed them. And I put that power island adjac adjacent to a ground plane and I route with the proper the capacity transmission line from the power supply to the power island. And then I have plenty more routing space to do real work. And the power supply will actually behave much better because you aren't putting other signals in the space or putting power supplies in spaces where they're not being used. So the same, you wouldn't do it with a clock, don't do it with a power supply. So power distribution, again, is the most critical that on the board. And it's where everything comes. Um, ideally, you want to have traces over a plane. I'm going to do some design examples using a two layer board because uh, even in a four layer board, if layer two is ground, layer four is still a single layer board. So there's some special things you need to do if you don't have ground planes or if you're in the case of a two layer board. But the idea is to put the traces as close together as you're allowed by manufacturing in order to create these transmission lines because again you need to have each switched conductor one dielectric away from ground and if it can't be a ground plane it needs to be a ground trace or a section of ground flood so this is a poor, poor drawing that i use the idea is i've got a connector and i've got my first capacitor and I route this and I, I've exacerbated the fact that I'm collapsing these so that they're as close together as possible to minimize the volume of the space so that it takes less energy to fill this space. And this capacitor is as close to the connector as I'm allowed to reduce the time it takes for the energy to come from the wiring harness to this capacitor. Now, this is a very special capacitor. This is 
capacitor. People call them filter or bypass capacitors, but that's not what happens. This capacitor presents a very low impedance transmission line in the path of the field coming in from off the board. So from the wiring harness, there are going to be impulses of energy coming from interference wherever, and this bubble of field will cause a higher density of field, a higher voltage to be trying to come in. So you've got a wave coming in at a higher voltage. It sees this low impedance. So this transmission line, you know, especially if it's on a, a single layer, is probably, you know, 100 ohms or more. It sees this ceramic capacitor, which has an impedance more in the order of 10 milliamps, or 10 milliohms, sorry. And so it wants desperately to fill this space. So this acts like a, 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 a bucket to catch this bubble of field, store it, and then release it slowly back into the wiring harness. So it doesn't really filter or bypass anything. It catches this energy and releases it. So this has to be as close as possible to the wiring harness pins, because until you see this filter element, you've got evil wiring harness routed on your board. Now, this could be even more complicated. You might have a, a reverse battery diode or a common mode choke or any number of things in this place. But the idea is that this protection circuit needs to be as close to the connector as possible so that the, the signals routed away from it are now conditioned so that they're not bringing evil onto your board. This next capacitor is a large capacitor who's going to be the source of energy for this power on your circuit board. Because the wiring harness and wherever the energy is coming from is so far away, you can't depend on getting the energy there and back, you know, the waves there and back fast enough to move the energy for you. So you have a large bulk storage capacitor whose job it is to pull energy from the wiring harness and store it for use on the board. Then I route it to my voltage regulator, which in this case is just a linear regulator, to the, uh, from the capacitor. So here I'm showing, I've got the continuous conductor here, the ground, and the continuous, the switch conductor, which is the power conductor, goes to the input lead of the voltage regulator. Now, the continuous conductor will continue over through here until uh, I get to the output capacitor for this uh, voltage regulator. The switch conductor is now switched through the body of the transistor from this pin to this pin. So the dielectric is continuous through this space, through the body of the, di of the transistor, and now it's into this space here. So my continuous conductor is here, my continuous dielectric is here, and the switch conductor is here. And now I have a bulk storage capacitor on the output. So the only, this, the job of this capacitor is to be the supply for the board for, if this is a five volt regulator, this is where I need to be getting all of my five volt energy from, this capacitor. Because this transistor is the size of Texas, it switches really slowly. So it doesn't respond to changes in its need. So the only thing I want this poor transistor to do is something it's capable of based on its physical geometry and the physical distance between the capacitors. It takes charge from this capacitor and puts it into this capacitor. That's the only thing it has to worry about. It's very capable of doing that. And then I start to route my continuous conductor and my power supply or the switch conductor to where I need it to be. Now, one of the things I was taught was you gotta put a, a high frequency cap here too. Well, when you start to think about it, if there's anything that this capacitor is gonna help with, you know, a frequency that exceeds the ability of this capacitor, it's already found a quarter wavelength. So if I'm gonna buy this capacitor, I need to put it over where it needs to be so it can do some good. Otherwise, I don't want to pay for it. Now, I don't want to add cost to my board to buy things that aren't doing any work. This guy here isn't doing any work, so I want to put him somewhere else or get rid of him. And this is the flow of energy. It's going to be from the wiring harness to this capacitor, through, and then from this capacitor through the transistor 
to this capacitor, and then this will be the source of energy for five volts on the circuit board. So you have to worry about what we can do. You need to know what your fabricator can do. You know, how close can these traces be without having problems? And then again, you're still trying to make sure everything is lumped and down there. So transmission lines, this is the same circuit board. Now I've got an IO signal coming on this pin, and I need to get up to this capacitor on the top of the board. So I, I'd use a via, red is the second layer. This is a two layer board. So I bring the signal up with the via to one end of my filter capacitor, and I connect it to the ground. So looking at the continuous conductor to here, the continuous dielectric is starting at the wiring harness, then along the bottom of the board diagonally to the ground pin and then up to here. So through the board, I've got this continuous dielectric. And then I start to route the signal across the board with the signal trace next to a ground trace. So I continue my rule. I've got my continuous conductor, which is ground, and I've got my switch conductor, which is the IO, after the filter and the space where the energy flows is between those two pieces of copper. So again, you put the filters as close to the connector as you're allowed to uh, and make sure that you don't violate that. The second one, I've got another trace on this pin. I put these two capacitors as close together as I'm allowed, use a common ground point, and then route the signal again. So I'm routing them, it's signal, ground, signal. I call this a triplet. And this is all about lots of different threes. There's no big numbers in electro electronic system design. So I route a triplet, and we'll talk about that now. If you route a, a signal ground signal, you've got each of those signals is one dielectric away from ground. Is that as good as a signal over a ground plane? No, but if you don't have a ground plane on the next layer, you have to provide the defined space for the signal. Better than nothing is a ground trace. You don't need one for each signal, so you can do signal ground signal and get fairly good trace routing density and provide reasonably good signal integrity. You know, you can't do controlled impedance, but these are signals in this case coming off a wiring harness. They can't be controlled impedance anyway. The other thing is on a two layer board, unless you do some very special work, you can't have controlled impedance anyway. So you don't have signals that are switching very fast. Everything has to be lumped. So this is the idea. If I've got three signal traces side by side, you know, there the signal is going to be in between each of these and all three are going to share and somewhere over here is the ground and they all find their way to ground. So the loss is these two are going to mess with each other. These two are going to be here. These are going to be here and all these somehow are going to find the ground. So the way you can get away from having these three or 10 or 20 signals share the same space is you put a ground trace between them. Again, is that as good as a trace over a plane? No. But if you can't afford it in your board design, then this way you can at least put some reasonable control over the behavior of the signals. Secondary side, the same thing. And then here's where we have our signals routed nice and cleanly. If I get to a micro, so I'm routing my power supply, nice switch conductor, unbroken dielectric and uh, ground. I have a large capacitor somewhere in the region of the ICs that I'm feeding, and this is the source of energy for the IC. So the only job that the output capacitor of the voltage regular has is to fill this guy up. So the package is large, the depletion waves have a low frequency, and the magnitude of the drop is going to be low because you're restricted to how much energy you can get per wave cycle because they're far apart. This guy has to be the one. So all that capacitor has to do is to source energy here. And it's physically capable of doing that. On the IC side, I put a capacitor close to the part. And then all this local capacitor's job is to refill these little ones. Now they're closer together. So the wave cycle time is less. So I have more time to move energy in and out. And then that's the energy sourcing into the device. Now. When I bring my signals in, I've got to bring 
the ground into the part and then the, the IO signals. So this is my thing. Uh, underneath the micro, you really don't want a route here. And this is why I, I try to flood underneath the part and I've exacerbated this to, to show you how important it is because if I don't have this ground flood underneath it, the problem is that the, there's not enough ground pins on the IC to give you good signal integrity going from the circuit board through the lead frame into the die. You know, for example, this signal, the nearest ground is two pins away. So all these signals are forced to share the same space to get into the part. These signals are all shared, forced to share the space between this ground plane. So in order to reduce the volume of space where these signals are sharing the same space, you spread out the ground so that they're only blending together in this immediate area. It helps reduce the impact of the fact that nobody wants to pay for lots of ground pins on the ICs. I love the new exposed pad parts because you can't route in there and all the pins are pretty close to ground. So it gives you a good way to move signals from the printed circuit board into the IC itself. The other thing I'm showing here is if there's an internal voltage regulator, you want to put that capacitor as close as possible to the pins. And it's a, a discrete domain in this case. We have energy that comes from on the chip into this capacitor and then back onto the chip. It doesn't go anywhere else. So this pin ideally would not even be connected to system ground, only to the ground pin on the IC. And then it's connected on the other side. But the idea is that sometimes a discrete domain works, but it has to be truly discrete. The only way fields move in this space is going to be from the IC through the wire bonds lead frame into the capacitor and then back up into the IC. This needs to be close because this is core. Those are the fastest switching transistors. If, if this is only feeding IOs and the IOs are switching in a nanosecond, this capacitor could be as much as a half an inch away and still be within the 20th wavelength goal that we have. As long as we make sure we route it with the transmission line that is one dielectric ground. So if you can't do triplets, you can do quints. Signal, signal, ground, signal, signal. You know, is that better than anything else? No, but it's better than signal, 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 ground somewhere. So it's just one way of helping improve the overhaul behavior of a board. And when you look at these outer layers and you use this philosophy, you're increasing its robustness and resistance to ESD. In designs that I've done on two layer boards using this process, I've been able to achieve 25 kV in uh, an AC power meter example. So it works. Oscillators, all the oscillator app notes are, are wrong because they don't seem to understand anything. The one I especially love is the one with the hook of copper around the outside. You know, let's put an antenna there. So you have to understand what the oscillator is. This is a low frequency, low amplitude signal. It's not dangerous. It's susceptible so you have to protect it and the what i do is i created this design where i've got the lowest impedance i can make for the transmission line so extel is a power supply this is a discrete domain vss pll is rarely on a qfp between the leads so you have to somehow get this continuous dielectric and continuous conductor so diagonally through the board so i drop a via to the next layer so this is on layer two and the dielectric is now diagonally through the board to this point. I bring it up to a via to the top of the board. I flood underneath the oscillator as much as I can. I, if there needs to be a feedback resistor, it's here. And then I put the capacitors on the outside. So the energy flow is through this space into the capacitor, back into the, the crystal body, into this capacitor, and then back through this space into the EXTL pin. The energy goes out and comes back in. This is a discrete domain. So in a pure world, this would not be system ground. This would be a unique crystal ground because you have the ability to make it completely discrete. The energy only goes in and out of this, nothing else. 
The other thing I do is I carve a hole in the ground flood, at least two or three H being the thickness of the dielectric around this structure. And then I make sure that I've flooded everything is maximum. The idea is that I present a, whole, a, a low impedance here and a, a low surface area and a large surface area outside of it. The biggest problems with crystal oscillators related to ESD is going to be the uh, the loss of lock in the PLL. And it's being, you get a burst of energy coming from the outside world or a test fixture, it causes the PLL to see extra oscillation events. It loses count and it eventually will cause your part to reset. So by doing this structure, carving out a hole around it and then flooding the rest of the board, I fix so many loss of lock problems with the PLLs. This works great. The other thing I want to point out is lump distance for this circuit is measured in feet. All the app notes, put it as close to the part as possible. No, you don't have to. If I need to do something here, because if this is VSS PLL, this is probably VDD PLL. I need a capacitor here because that's core and I have to put a charge well right there to support those depletion waves. So if I need to push this out of the way to improve routing in this area, I can do that. As long as I make sure the transmission lines are intact, I can push this a couple inches away. It won't make any difference. And it allows me to do things that are more important here close to the IC. So a lot of lore, based on how things don't work, this is applying the physics to it. And I have many examples where it works. If it's a BGA, you might actually have a VSS PLL pin and you can route underneath here like this. And the only reason I don't normally route under components, I wanna point this out, is because this again is a discrete domain and these signals are all engaged in the same field. So this goes under here because this signal is related to here and this signal is related to here and now are both connected to the resistor, which is related to that ground. So it's a three layer, three interconnects that are the same. Again, you make this as large as you're allowed based on your manufacturing rules. And it gets a little complicated if it's a four pin, but the same idea has to be applied. So this is just a quick write up of what we were talking about here. So test results. And I've I've been applying these philosophies to boards for a number of years now. So I did a, a, an engine controller. It's a two-cylinder engine control, two-layer board aimed at uh, um, low-cost manufacturing. So no fancy fab, low-cost fabs uh, at a uh, typically low-cost application. And we use an S12 micro. And what we end up with a board that's fairly dense. It's about the size of a business card. Top primary side, these are the, the engine control ICs. This is the processor, the uh, IGBT ignition driver. So this did spark and fuel and all kinds of stuff. So a complete standalone engine controller for his two cylinder engine. Uh, this is the top side. This is the bottom, the primary side. And all these traces are routed as triplets. So every signal is routed with an adjacent ground plane because I don't have ground trace. I don't have the luxury of planes. Now, I want to point out something that I would do differently now is I have all this blank space in here that's copper flood. I would spread all these traces out so that the uh, more ground flood was between them to just help improve the overall behavior of the board. It reduces the uh, AMC footprint, increases its resistance to ESD, and so that would be the change I would do differently on this board. Secondary side, the same thing. I would push these traces out to make sure that this flood was in, included. But the results of this board, we sent it for testing, and I was at least 20 dB below the standard across the board. So this is a, a two-layer board, uh, an older technology quad flat pack um, device, but we were able to achieve EMC compliance uh, following these rules. So there is all the way out to 10 gigahertz. Then I had always been told by these special gurus in the classes about how important ground planes are. You ask them, well, what's that mean? How important is a ground plane? Well, it makes it better. Well, how much better? It makes it better. So I'm like, my customers aren't gonna take that as a, you know, it makes it better. 
how much better. So I decided I was going to prove it myself. So I designed a board, started with a two layer board. I picked a microcontroller with 112 pins and it was about the worst uh, ground pin to IO ratio I could find. This is in a technology where we didn't allow for any slew rate control. All the IOs were routed to a 10K resistor using six inch serpentine traits, traces. Uh, grounds were just routed kind of, you know, we, we just hooked it up and the filter place components were somewhere and we were looking at low cost fabs. So then we ran the part at 40 megahertz and toggled all the IOs as fast as we could. So this is the simple schematic for the board. The dark blue is the primary side, the light blue is the secondary side. Uh, so these are all the serpentines that we needed to get that six inch trace and the ground termination resistors. And, you know, we routed ground to make connections. Ground is connected with a voltmeter, you know, ohmmeter. It says what it's what it is. So when we ran the test on this, the gray is the ambient. And you can see right here at the 250 megahertz, the, got a big spike, about 23 dB, and then harmonics running all the way out. So this is an example of what I call clock coherent core switching noise. This is related to the, the switching speed of the transistors in the core. And there's a huge burst of energy at this 250 megahertz because that's directly the frequency based on the switching, the geometry of these transistors. Conducted, this is a six inches wiring harness to a battery, almost 45 dB of noise again at this 250 megahertz range and lots of bubbles all the way out through uh, harmonics. So I took the same board and just added a core with two solid ground planes. Didn't do anything but eliminate the ground, at ground traces, so they're all connected to the planes. Didn't do anything to add ground transition vias, didn't move any components, just added this core of solid ground planes and to make sure we were only changing one variable in the experiment. And here's the difference. The green is this new board. It goes from 23 to about 7 dB at this core switching event. And most of the harmonics are gone in the radiated spectrum. In conducted, we go from 45 almost to 12. So basically, what would you do? You get 30 dB of improvement by adding ground planes. And this wasn't optimized. It would be a whole lot better if I'd added ground transition vias. The next thing is I, I had a board. I designed this system for programming S12 microprocessors. And it's a four layer board. I had Rick Hartley look at it. I had uh, Dr. Hubing look at it. And we're like, oh, this is a good board. We really like it. You've done a good job. I sent it for test and it fails immunity at 110 megahertz. Like, how can this perfect board, blessed by the gods, fail EMC? And so once I stopped whining, I said, I, I need to figure this out. So in order to have susceptibility or radiated emission, what do you need? You need an antenna. So I'm like, OK, at 100 megahertz, what am I looking at? I go to my chart and I'm looking at about three feet because this is all ball. This is atom bombs and and horseshoes nothing has to be exact it gets you in the right place to know what you're looking for so i go look at that and i go what's on this circuit it's got a usb cable there's a wiring harness that's three feet long i'm like <sighs> so i look at the schematic in the circuit i forgot to put the filter cap on the usb power into the board that simple i did a bad copy of somebody else's design nice thing about a usb connector is it's the right size to drop a capacitor between the leads. This is a fairly low volume, so they can do that in manufacturing. I put the capacitor on, sent it back for test, and voila, it worked. So I could use the radiate emissions problem, the, 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 the frequency where it's failing, to figure out what frequency of energy that I needed, look for the structure that was involved in that energy, and go find where it is on the board. So I can take those test results and find where I need to change something to fix it. It works both ways. And then here's my compliance certificate. So the new rules of thumb, 
you flood your spaces with ground. So anywhere you're not routing signals or power supply, you flood it with ground. And in my rules, if the ground islands can't hit at least two vias in them, I spread things apart so that there's room or I remove them. And the, a lot of things good happen. The less etch required reduces the amount of chemical you consume in the, the etching process. It makes your boards greener. It increases the fidelity of the etch so your yields are higher. When you go into assembly, you have a much more balanced thermal profile and you get better yields in assembly. So you make your board cheaper because your yields are higher in fabrication. You make your boards greener because you've used less evil chemicals. You make your boards cheaper because you get higher yield in manufacturing in your assembly process, and because you built all these Faraday cages, your board is more robust and will resist more evil that your customer do, does to it. So you have higher reliability in the field just by not throwing away the copper you paid for. So I use a minimum etch on all my philosophies for design. You go to your fabricator and find out what are the minimum trace widths and spaces they will give you for the cost that you've been looking at. You may find that they'll give you thinner traces and spaces for the same price, which will allow you to increase your routing density. Because for the most part, you don't need very much copper for the transmission lines. I mean, the ICs have wire bonds that are really tiny. You can route with one mil traces for most signals if you could afford it, but find out what you can get from them. The same thing for drill sizes. You might find that they can do smaller drills than before, and you can reduce the footprint of the vias, again, to help increase your routing density. Board stack ups, a four layer board starts with a core that's pre-processed, pre sorry. And what they will do is they will print etch these outer layers, then they will lay some uh, prepreg material on the, both sides of the core, lay some copper foil down, then they will you know, heat this up and press it and uh, harden this prepreg, and then they will plate, they will print and etch and then drill and plate the outside of the board to make it. So the cost of the board is more founded in the number of processing steps than in the materials themselves. So there are there are two print and etch cycles for a four layer board or one plate and etch, one print and etch uh, cycle for a two layer board. So it roughly costs twice as much for a four layer board than a two layer board, not because of the material, because you have done two manufacturing processes. For a four layer board to a six layer board, you now have got more processes, so you've got about a 50% adder for to go from a four layer board to a six layer board. Six layer is my favorite stack up because then I would use layer two and layer five as the ground planes because automatically I now have one and three are paired together with the dielectrics connected automatically. If I have a via from one to three, I automatically connect the dielectrics in the horizontal planes to each other. Same thing for the bottom of the board. I just then have to remember if I route from one or three to four or six, that I need a ground transition via because these dielectrics are not connected to these dielectrics automatically. I have to put the plumbing in place for that to happen. So this is just a little bit, you can play some games with the thickness of these materials to change the impedance of these transmission lines that you're building on these layers. So again, I like the six layer the best, but on a four layer board, if ground is on two, one and three are automatically good transmission lines. Four is a single layer board. It is not referenced to layer two. It's two dielectrics and a signal layer away from two. You have to route it with coplanar ground traces or flood. And if you go from one to three, you must use a z-axis ground transition via to connect the dielectric between one and two or three and two to the dielectric in the horizontal on layer four. You go for six, 
if you go between the triplets, and again, here's all the threes again, one and three are automatically joined together because when you drill a hole for a signal via, there's a hole in the ground plane that gives you the continuous dielectric with the continuous ground and then the switch conductor. The layer count determinations, you know, typically in the past where I ran out of room to route it, so I need to buy a pair of layers. That's not the only thing you want to think about anymore. What level of EMC certification are you going to need? Is it for consumer and commercial, which is fairly easy, or are you doing something that's high reliability? So you have to think about what level of reliability you require and how tightly you have to manage the spaces for these signals. So the whole idea is as the IC geometries get smaller, you're not going to be able to put a 55 nanometer part on a two layer board that you're, you know, but we're replacing it with an eight bit part that was three bucks. And now we can get this one 50, 50 cents. But one is in, you know, 180 nanometers and one is in 55 nanometers. Suddenly the two layer board isn't going to be capable of managing the signals because of the switching speeds that are involved with this ID, IC. So the idea of system costs being reduced by reducing IG, IC geometries is another myth. And I'm gonna repeat this, system cost is not reduced by reducing system geometries. When you're sucked into moving from an 8-bit part that was three bucks to buying a new part that's 50 cents, it's got an ARM core, it's got flash, it's got all kinds of wonderful things, lots of memory, it's probably in a smaller package footprint. So your current fabricator uh, might have to charge you more for it. Suddenly you don't have you know, code that that's fits in assembly. Now you probably need to have an operating system. So you don't have a team that's capable of doing that. So you have to learn it or you have to pay somebody to do it. The other thing is you know, the 8-bit parts, the development tools, the hardware, in circuit emulate the emulators the debuggers the compilers are all relatively cheap 100 200 dollars you move into these 32-bit cores now go buy tools for them you know a, a debugger is like ten thousand dollars a compiler might be thirty thousand dollars so suddenly you've got a whole bunch of cost just to get into the business because purchasing found that they can buy this part for two dollars and fifty cents cheaper and it's going to take longer. And now it's in a smaller footprint. Oh, my my assembly plant can't place things that are 0.65 pitch or 0.8 pitch. Now you, all these things have to be taken into consideration. Do you get a huge increase in your feature set? Absolutely. Your product can do much more wonderful things with these higher power processors, but it doesn't come free. It doesn't reduce the cost. It's going to cost money to build them, to design them, and those features come at a cost. Power planes, people have talked about using power as a return. You know, it, it takes some special cases to make it work at all. But the bottom line is, when you move from reference to ground to reference to power, it has to change context. It has to fill a different space. So there's a temporal distortion because it takes time. Now, most there's going to be more than one signal doing that. So now we've got crosstalk, and then you've got to do it again. As a return. And this is the idea. When you have a signal, and I have to go from ground to power, even if the planes are close together, I have to fill this space. It takes time. So I've lost some temporal fidelity. And if there's more than one signal doing this somewhere, then all of them have to fill the same space and they go here. Then when you get back to where you're going, you gotta do it again. So you have to screw your signal up four times, twice temporally and twice crosstalk because you are using power as a return. Don't, it's even worse if the planes are farther apart. You have to use a capacitor. And if this is only if these two are adjacent to each other. I see app notes where signal, ground, signal, signal, power, ground, and they use power as a return, it's two signal layers away from ground. When you see things like that, they better not make sense anymore. 
and you want to ignore those types of things. Here's with ground transition vias. Again, when I go from one to three, I have a hole around the via. My dielectric is continuous, and my my uh, continuous conductor is the ground plane, and my switch conductor does its thing. So the dielectric is always cool. What you have with the single layers on each side of a ground plane is you get a paired dielectric automatically. Makes for good transmission lines. If I got to go from one to six and two and five are ground, I have to connect that paired dielectric with this paired dielectric in the Z axis with a ground transition via. I've had customers fail EMC with one missing ground transition via. So when you move, from one space to the other, you've got to make sure that in all three axes that you have the plumbing. If you put a water faucet in the basement and you turn it on and you don't have a pipe going upstairs, eventually the water is going to get there, but you're not going to like the results. The same thing happens with fields. You cannot put a ground transition via there. It'll find a ground via somewhere and it'll find a way to get there, but on the way it's going to mess up every signal that's in that same space. That's where all the bad rules came from. So you have to make sure that you have ground transition vias for the energy. Splitting ground planes, you can't cross splits. You know, that's the problem with trying to mix domains. If you do that, anytime you cross over the split, you're going to cause a problem with signal integrity. So if I've got a trace running over a plane, most of the field is going to be in the shadow of the trace. That's what we've learned. If I have to cross a split, the field has to follow the continuous conductor. So this space becomes, instead of just underneath the trace, it's the space that the split has created. So the field fills this space. It takes time. You lose temporal fidelity, and it takes the energy away from the signal. And the, the signal is not smart enough to know that it only has to go this way. It goes the other way at the same time. That's how you design a slot antenna. And then if you, you're never just going to have one trace crossing over here. There's going to be lots of traces crossing over here. So all these signals now share the same space. So you have added temporal and crosstalk to the distortion. And this is what happens when they tell you to use a ferrite to isolate analog ground or some other special ground, is unless all of the signals can then be powered from a supply that's referenced to this half of the copper, it always has to find its way to the connection point. So if they're not totally discrete domains where a sensor you're trying to read is powered by supply that's referenced to the special analog ground 32, it will have to find the ferrite or neck of copper in order to make its way there because the ground the ground has to be continuous. And no matter what magic somebody tries to tell you, it only knows how to find that spot. So all the signals cross over the space. And A to D converter app notes are the worst. They want you to put an isolated power supply going to the A to D. And then they don't say anything about well, how do you condition the A to D inputs? Well, those are all still referenced to system ground. So no matter what you do, you've on purpose screwed up your analog signal that you're trying to do careful measurements for. The only way this works is if the domain is discrete. I see a lot of times where people want to put Bluetooth or Wi-Fi chips isolated from system by the split. Well, that's fine as long as everything goes into and out of that space over this. But you. You don't need to make the split in order to keep these signals happy. You know, they, as long as you route a good transmission line, it's not going to go over here. It's going to go where you put it. And then at that point, it's, it is a discrete because it goes into the antenna and back in through the antenna and back into the system. But you don't even have to do the splits to isolate those devices. So Dr. Hubing, who really knows what he's talking about, always says, thou shalt not split ground. One of the sayings from the signal integrity consultants is that if they see more than one symbol for ground on a circuit board, they know there's a lot of money to be made. So don't give them money because you're not following the rules. The conductor has to be continuous 
the dielectric has to be continuous. The only thing you get to mess with is the switched conductor. If you do have to split a, tra a plane because you need one more trace here, put a bridge trace. You know, is it a discontinuity? Certainly, but nothing like what we saw here. In fact, unless this is switching really quick, this will probably be lumped. But the idea is that you have to make sure you're dealing with the idea of continuous conductor, continuous dielectric. Now, if you do have to change context, then you use a capacitor. And this actually is a very effective solution when you're dealing with high voltage or battery management systems. If you've got a high voltage ground and there's control lines that go from the digital realm into this battery management realm, you route this isolated ground with a capacitor. Shield ground from a USB or Ethernet. You connect it to system ground with a capacitor. And then you route your differential pairs from the differential world where they're truly differential into the digital world. This works, but I don't advise this if this is power and ground. I don't do that. Corners, there was all these myths about, you know, you can't use sharp corners because the electrons will split off the edges. None of these have any impact on signal integrity on anything you're going to do on FR4. The only thing to worry about is where there are corners like this and this is that you can get acid pooling and possibly over etch and it will affect your yield in fabrication or even worse it'll affect your reliability in the field but eventually these traces could become opens this is the best but most tools will only do 45s 45s are just fine and none of these affect signal integrity differential signals i'm going to make this clear on a printed circuit board, until you force them to be, all differential signals are really single-ended because they come from the same source of energy. You have an inverting and a non-inverting driver. The energy comes from the same power supply. One is, a, one is an inverted version of the other. They're still referenced to ground. There is no reason to manage the differential impedance. They're, if you need them controlled impedance, make them both 50 ohms. They don't have to even be next to each other because it's all dominated by the surface area. Side-by-side -side traces, there's the thickness of the foil. The six mil trace over a plane, there's a huge amount of surface area that's involved in managing the field. So you wanna put, if it's a real differential like USB or ethernet, you wanna put the um, transmission lines close together, but you want the phi to be as close to the connector as possible so that then you can rip away system ground because on the wiring harness, there is no ground, so the, the signals are referenced to each other. You know, the issue is that differentials were created from a computer to computer interface where they found that they had a signal going from one computer to the other, that they got problems with the, the ground connection, because there might end up being such a difference in drop from one location to the other that the signal integrity was affected, or even there were problems with things catching on fire. So somebody really smart came up with the idea of using a differential driver, and then they would use a inverted signal going down the transmission line with the pair of wires to a zero cross detector, and then it would see wherever the signals crossed, it would create one edge of the bit. Then they discovered that they were having problems with common mode noise being applied to one signal more than the other. So they got even smarter. They twisted the pair so that each one of the signals was being affected by about the same amount of common mode noise, got to the, the uh, crossover detection, signal came through clean. On a printed circuit board, you can't twist them. There's always gonna be more common mode noise or interference from adjacent traces based on the square of the distance. So all you can do is remember they're single-ended, they're single -ended, route them as well-defined transmission lines, and when you can it, get it to the connector and the, and the wiring harness, that's when you will place the, the traces away from system ground. So ideally, the phi is right next to the connector, and then you just drive those two signals out of the part. I like to route them on top of each other so I've got surface area again so that plus and minus are on two layers adjacent 
get to the connector pins, and now I'm into the wires, and I've got as clean a delivery of energy from the physical interface to the wiring harness as I possibly can. But until I give them that opportunity and remove system ground, they are still single-ended. H-bridge motor control, driving speakers, all those are true differentials, and you want to get them away from system ground in order to make them differential. But until you do so, they are still single-ended signals. Timing critical, there's all these crazy things. Oh, you need to route things within plus or minus 10 mils. You know, there is a spec in each of the memory interfaces that talks about allowable timing skew, and this is defined by the state machines they're using. And if you take that spec and, and calculate how physically long that might be, you're going to be surprised at what they're making you do. Because even in a 500 megahertz DVR memory interface, the data lines, it's plus or minus 250 mils, not 10. So you end up serpentining. I've seen many, many companies burn lots of layers of routing in order to make these arbitrary uh, requirements for their uh, timing requirements. So we're going to wrap up with fields are in the space. Got to remember that. It's all about the space. The switching speeds of the transistors are what's important. You don't care how often it hurts, not pulse recurrent time, how much it hurts, how fast are they switching. Signals and power connections need to be one dielectric from ground. If a layer is not adjacent to a ground plane, it's an orphan layer and must be routed as if it was a single layer board. There's no such thing as noisy ground. Ground can't make noise. It's one conductor. Noise is changes in voltage that are not wanted to be in a space. If you've got noise, you've got more than one signal sharing the same space, you need to take a look at your transmission line design. Again, Dr. Hubing, thou shalt not split ground. And anytime you break any of these rules, you're going to pay the consequences. I have a reading list that I got from Mr. Hartley, a couple of good lists of books. I want to point out some more references. Uh, Ralph Morrison's Fast Circuit Boards is probably the one book you want to buy if you want to buy a single book. Uh, we've been able to get uh, uh, Ralph Morrison was taped in his last public speaking event, and we have that on ralphmorrison.com. It's a pay-per-view event. There are three two-hour sessions, and all the proceeds go to Ralph's widow. These are some links to some of the best places to get uh, more information for PC board design and EMC. I also want to take a moment to thank Rick Hartley for all of his um, great help and tutoring. And, you know, Ralph Morrison, he changed my life and my career. And, and just we lost him too soon and too few people realized just how much he had to share with us. And then Dr. Hubing has become a friend and a mentor as well. So I've been very blessed in that. The idea again is that it's all about threes. You get three components, conductors, spaces, and switches. And you can only do three things with, with energy. You can store it, move it, or connect, convert it to kinetic energy. It's not rocket science. We're just leak plumbers with very leaky water pipes. You know, we have to design the three-dimensional spaces to manage the fields so it does what we want. So well-defined transmission lines are the key. You route them carefully, you can have better results without adding any kind of extra cost or PC board layers. You can take your test results and use that to figure out where you need to make changes to be compli compliant. And there is no black magic anymore. It's simple science. And I'm going to end with what Ralph always said. Buildings have hall, walls and halls. People travel in the halls, not the walls. Circuits have traces and spaces. Energy and signals travel in the spaces, not the traces. So thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate that you've come to, to listen to this. My fervent hope is that you can be able to use this to improve your designs. And I want to thank uh, Professor Obeng again for his um, allowing me to be part of this and uh,
we're very pleased to be this. So thank you. Thank you very much.